Um, so would we call this sin addition or anti-addition? Sin. Sin, because the hydrogens are coming in from the same direction in both cases. Uh, we, we're not going to go through the whole mechanism for this reaction. Can hydrogenation only occur with sin? That's right, yeah. And what I was going to say is, we, um, even though we're not going to go through the whole mechanism, we should try to explain why it has to be sin. Well, what's the role that the palladium on carbon is playing here? Um, what's the name for the role it plays in the reaction? It's just the catalyst. The catalyst yeah. yeah, this is just the catalyst. You can see it's not actually joining. You don't have to use palladium on this. Oh, by the way, this stands for palladium on carbon. There's a couple other uh, metal catalysts you could use here. The important point is, what's going to happen is that both hydrogens are first going to attach to the same spec of palladium. Okay. Both hydrogens will attach to the same spec of palladium, and since they're attached to the same spec of palladium, they have to come in from the same direction. If this is the palladium, the two hydrogens will both be attached to the same spec of palladium, and then they're going to attack the alkene. Well, that, since they're coming in from the same spec, they're going to come in from the same direction. So this explains why this is what we would call a sin, or same side addition. Uh, we're going to see anti-additions pretty soon, but this would be a sin or a same side addition. Okay, so I think the best way to get the right products here is to draw the alkene in this form, with wedges and dashes, even though this is not usually how we draw alkenes, but you actually got the right products too. Uh, the only big mistake you made is not immediately drawing the second product. So we always have to ask whether we're going to get one product or two here. Remember our general rule, anytime we attack something trigonal planar, we get a maximum of two products. So if you're attacking something trigonal planar, you should ask if you're going to get those two products. Well, here we're attacking something trigonal planar. Um, so if we're producing stereocenters, we're going to get those two products. And those are enantiomers, right? Yes, these are uh, the enantiomers of each other. That's right. Like you said, that reaction was called uh, hydrogenation. Uh, because we're adding hydrogens. Additions. The bad news is you can see there's actually a lot of important reactions in here. But you actually, I think you already knew the basics of hydrogenation. So we actually start here on the top of page three of the alkenes handout. If you look at the top of page three of the alkenes handout, uh, we went over hydrogenation. And I actually I show the mechanism in a little bit more detail there. I show how the palladium works. But actually, for most, in most cases, you don't need to draw the whole mechanism. Um, we saw that the stereochemistry is two, um, I should have said sin addition, not cis addition. Um, one thing you have to now keep asking yourself about it, so one thing to keep in mind is, as the course goes on, synthesis is going to become a bigger and bigger part of each exam. Organic chemistry is really about learning how to do synthesis, and the more reactions you learn, the more in synthesis they'll be on the exam. So you have to keep asking yourself every time you learn a new reaction, how would I know when to use this on a synthesis problem? How would I know when to use this on a synthesis problem? Well, let's take a look at what um, hydrogenation does. What would be the product of this reaction? It would get rid of the double bond. It would just be cyclohexane. So the interesting thing that hydrogenation does is it removes a functional group without replacing it with a new functional group. We can call it's an H, right? Yeah, it's putting in H's. But carbon-hydrogen bonds are not considered functional groups. Um, so we could call this defunctionalizing. Defunctionalizing is you, was when you replace a functional group with no functional group. Um, and we really haven't seen many reactions that defunctionalize. Mm -hmm. So let's say this was a synthesis problem. If this was a synthesis problem and you were looking at this, uh, this ring over here, um, you would say to yourself, gee, 
this is a very weird product because it has no functional groups. Can I think of any reactions that produce something with no functional groups? Well, hydrogenation is one of the most important you can think of there. By the way, remember that this is a functional group. A double bond between carbons is considered a functional group, even though it doesn't have an oxygen or a nitrogen or a halogen there. Let's do this synthesis problem. You mentioned that you, uh, now is a good time to just get started getting ready for uh, the final. So for each uh, reaction, you should see when you would have to use it on synthesis. Okay. All right, so we're going to need more than one step here. Can you think of any steps that will allow us to get from that starting material to this product? Um, making that a carbocation. And then? And then adding H. How would you add the H? Now, like this. No, HBR. OK. No, no. So the reaction you're thinking of wouldn't uh, work there. HBR no. is not nucleophilic. I OK. I don't know what, but I didn't mean Why don't we go through that one step by step? Okay. Now, there actually is kind of a way, I think, to make what you were thinking of work here. I think there is a way to make what you were thinking of work here. Um, but let's think about a different approach. Uh, since that I'm was thinking of the ones where you add it, where you add the Br to it, where it's like where you make a, you have HBr, you make a carbocation, you add the H to the less substituted, substituted, and then you add the Br to the right. Now the problem with that is that wouldn't give us no functional yeah, groups. I know, that's what I was okay. <laughs> so let's think our, through our thought process here. We can see that the product here has no functional groups. Um, so what's one of the reactions? One of the, what's one reaction that we know that uh, gives you no functional groups? Hydrogenation. hydrogenation. Okay, good. Um, however, what type of starting material does hydrogenation work on? What type of functional group do you need? To do? Bonds, bonds. Yeah, you need a double bond. So we know we're not going to hydrogenate this. Instead, we can do what, uh, what you, we've been calling retrosynthesis. If we could somehow get a double bond here, then we could hydrogenate it. Mm -hmm. So this is this idea of retrosynthesis. Remember that retrosynthesis is just a fancy word for working backwards from the product. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like the intermediate that gave us this product was cyclohexene, which was then hydrogenated. So then we want to ask, do we know any reactions that will get us from this starting material to this intermediate? Uh, well, what we need to do there is introduce a double bond. So can you think of any reactions we've learned that introduce a double bond? Elimination. That's right. Uh, usually, it's um, in many cases, it's easiest to use E2. Because remember that oftentimes E1 gives you a mix with SM1. But there's ways to use E1 for synthesis. But let's focus on using E2. Well, what would be a good reagent to get an E2 reaction here? Um, Can you remember a reagent that's pretty sure to give us E2? No. Not sure? OK. I can't. Now, remember that the, most, the thing that almost always gives us E2 is strong, bulky bases. Okay. The thing that almost always gives us E2 is strong, bulky bases. I gave you the, uh, the handout on SN2 and E2, right? With the table? Yeah, now yeah, we can take a look at that. Let's take a look at page 3. The bottom of page 3 of the SN2, SN1, E2, and E1 handout. Now, if you look at the strong, bulky bases here, LDA and tert-butyl oxide, you can see they pretty much always give you E2, pretty much guaranteed. Uh, the, the right hand side of the table at the bottom of page three. Either of those strong bulky bases, LDA or terpenoid oxide, is almost guaranteed to give you E2. And remember, when you're doing a synthesis, you want something that's going to give you a pure yield. You don't want a bunch of competing reactions. All right, so uh, let's use terpenoid oxide here. Now, I know um, this reaction, I guess, was for the last exam, but this is a reaction that's going to be important for the whole rest of the course next semester, too. Um, so it's important to keep uh, reviewing and remembering it. And you're sure to need to use it on synthesis uh, on your final exam for this course as well. OK, um, because after all, what you're learning to do right now is, what you can, uh, is reactions that you can do on alkenes. But that doesn't do you any good in synthesis unless you can make the alkene in the first place. So we need to remember how to make those. All right, and now we're pretty much done. So what would be the answer here? Well, step one. would be to put in the tert-butyl oxide. 
if you wanted to, you could show a counter ion sodium terpetal oxide. And then step two is to do the hydrogenation. You'd want to remember those as two separate steps. All right, the important thing that we just went through here is the thought process for this simple uh, retrosynthesis. What was the thought process? Well, we looked, um, and uh, one important thing is most people kind of focus too much on the starting material for synthesis. You want to focus at least as much on the product and ask, how can I get this product? Well, the thing that should jump out at us here is this product has no functional groups. And again, you only know very few reactions that remove functional groups. So you should say, gee, I'll bet that the last step was hydrogenation. But we can't do a hydrogenation on this because it's not an alkene, so we must have done hydrogenation on an intermediate. 